Good morning. Nice to see so many committed and willing people attending this morning. And we trust, and I particularly trust, that you feel benefited because of your efforts. The Bible. When you hear this term or mention of the book, what do you think of? Rex thinks of God's word, but what do you think about God's word? Is it an endless expanse of rules or is it an endless expanse of marvellous grace? Both of these things can be a cause of indifference towards God, who is the centre of the Bible. In the Bible, we're able to witness the record of how God, the Creator, lives with his created people. That's you and me and all the generations before us, from Adam and Eve. In Genesis, we're introduced to an ideal world that's perfect. It is such a beautiful revelation of God's beauty and the beauty that he desires for each of us. Personal meetings daily with God. That must be the best way to know God. I wonder how he would have dealt with an increased population if the fateful temptation of Eve had failed. And there were lots of people who would want to have their expected daily commune with God. But alas, the drama of sin that dismayed God so much, he caused mass death to the earth's population except for eight people. This story is described from Genesis 6, if you ever get interested. This is one of the early stories of salvation in the Bible. People just needed to accept salvation, their ticket onto the boat, and they could be saved like Noah and his family. And this metaphor of the flood is later used by Jesus when he references his return to earth. The story of Abraham is introduced early in Genesis 2, after the world has recovered from the flood. Abram sees, seems to be such a meek type of guy. In chapter 12, the Lord says to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family and go to the land that I'll show you. God said that he would be blessed. Then the narrative says, so Abram departed as the Lord had instructed. All seems pretty painless, doesn't it? Abram headed for Canaan, and then the Lord appeared in a dream and said, I'll give this land to your descendants. For the rest of Abraham's life, his whole purpose was about fulfilling this promise, arguably. Was it smooth sailing for Abraham towards this goal? What was fulfilment contingent on? I saw Rex move his lips, but having an heir. And where is the most reasonable place to have an heir? An heir to the throne? you end up with a baby. And a baby is born in order to continue the family line. So we witness moments when we are surprised by Abraham's behaviour that we don't go out of our way to discuss it at times in his pursuit of this goal of fulfilling the promise that God had made. Who else comes to mind when we think about confused love?
one of Abraham's grandchildren, in fact. Who do you think it might be? I can't hear the raised voices. Jacob. Jacob is the bloke I was thinking of. The story of Jacob seems to strike a chord for us for a few reasons, particularly in Australia, I'd suggest, but generally across humanity. One of them is fairness. Now, Australia is noted as the fair country, isn't it? And where is the fairness of getting swindled from the girl he had worked seven years for just to land up with the frumpy sister? These circumstances coloured so much of future life for Jacob's descendants. It seems so incongruous that while Jacob was running away from his brother's threatened danger, he stops at Bethel and sleeps with a stone as a pillow, you might have noticed in our song earlier, and God promises him the ground that he's lying on in a dream when he witnesses the stairway to heaven in Genesis 28. There are so many stories of Jacob's family that tend to remain in the pages of the Bible because we don't feel comfortable to discuss them, as well as maybe David. The story of Joseph in Egypt is perhaps one of the most climactic stories of salvation. Most of Joseph's brothers hated him, and so they wanted to kill him. That's sort of what hate does to people. The next best thing was to spare his life and sell him to slave traders. At least they wouldn't have blood on their hands. His brothers, that is. So, in the fullness of God's time, Joseph is reunited with his family. Joseph was now in a position of power, greater than that of his brothers, who had once dominated him. But now Joseph could only exploit his authority for so much. This union of brothers and father is such a warm and solemn occasion that it initiates the beginning of Israel in Egypt. Imagine if this was happening in America, Australia or England. What would the media be saying? Should these foreigners be allowed to take over such a fertile piece of the country? But here is one of those stories in the Bible where peace, justice and obedience work tremendously towards a wonderful time of prosperity. Now let's jump some hundreds of years to the time of King David to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Now this chapter commences a story that appears to be a little out of sequence but it's very much in context because it explains much about the history of Israel and much of our understanding of God's grace. What's the story? Pardon? Yes, we're talking about David and Bathsheba. David finds himself culturally dominant and exploits that power in what turns out to be a highly embarrassing circumstance. We have heard of this circumstance frequently, and for some reason, having babies out of wedlock has always been viewed with compromised favour. So, to deal with this, David hatches a plan that backfires. Nathan the prophet comes to counsel David with a rebuke. David confesses his guilt and the Lord forgives him, but the price is the death of their baby. Fully innocent. Another picture of mercy, but also a picture of the cost that mercy brings with it. This seemed to give David a renewed picture of God. It's also interesting to notice David's intercessory prayer for his son. But alas, it did not change the course of their baby's illness. 
this experience did result in Psalm 51. And what's Psalm 51? You'll have, you'll have to keep guessing then, won't you? You may have noticed part of this psalm quoted in the invocation song earlier. Just a very small part. It is a common human tray to want mercy for our guilt. And in this psalm, David expresses it very clearly, possibly based on his renewed view and understanding of God. Unplanned pregnancies still happen today. And sometimes unplanned pregnancies result in women having unplanned or attempted abortions. Many times the mothers-to-be are young, and it seems reasonable at the time that not having a baby is simple. You may have noticed that I referred to attempted abortions. Remarkably, not all abortions are successful, and many babies survive the efforts to end their lives. One such per person is Melissa Oden. Melissa survived in 1977 when she was born, and that was probably the year that Elvis Presley died too, wasn't it? I remember the place at school that I was when someone told me, and I think it was 1977. Despite the initial concerns regarding Melissa's future, after surviving the attempt to end her life at approximately seven months gestation, she, was, she not only survived, but thrived. With a master's degree in social work, she has worked in the fields of substance abuse, mental health, domestic violence and sexual assault counselling, and child welfare. Melissa was formerly a college outreach speaker too, in 2012, Melissa founded the Abortion Survivors Network. ASN seeks to educate the public about failed abortions and survivors while providing emotional, mental and spiritual support to abortion survivors. Since ASN's inception, Melissa has been in contact with over 210 survivors. Melissa has made it her ministry to facilitate healing, compassion and love in difficult circumstances. Now, I just want to show you a little video clip that has Melissa being interviewed where she's expressing her understanding of living in God's time. Now, who rescued you? Because this was a, a failed procedure. Uh, your grandmother was present in in the room. She was a, a nurse. That's as right. You said, you know, a lot of this, you know, I just love how God unfolds things in his perfect time. And, um, you know, this has been a, a long process for me. God has unfolded the truth about my life year after year, piece by piece. And I'm thankful for that um, because he knows what's best for me. And I can honestly say if I would have been told even five years ago, that it was my grandmother that forced that abortion upon my biological mother. If I would have been told that my grandmother delivered me there at the hospital and demanded that I be left to die. Thankfully, she didn't get her way. Oh. And I know people hear that and it's extreme. You know, this is like the plot line of a movie, right? Really? That's what I always have to tell people. Um, it's surreal to live this life, but I don't, I don't hate her for doing that. I don't. You know what? We all make mistakes. People sin every day. I sin <laughs> I, every day, I would suspect. And I don't falter for that. Another person I'd like to introduce you to this morning is named Gianna Jessen. Now, if you were to talk to Gianna Jessen for just a few minutes, she's likely to punctuate every sentence with a deep, infectious laugh. Talk to her for a while longer and as her story unfolds it becomes apparent that the constant joy she has overcome, with constant joy she has overcome unspeakable challenges. 
In many regards, her life has been a short path littered with obstacles at every turn. Challenges, betrayal and cruelty. But for every setback, there have also been invitations into the greatest halls of government. A life that was never meant to be has been used to inspire, even save others. You see, Gianna Jessen was intended to die before she was born. Instead of death, though, Gianna was bathed in a burning saline solution that she overcame to enter the world. Two months premature and weighing just two and a half pounds, she spent her first couple of months in hospital. Eventually, she entered the foster care system. The failed abortion had also provided the gift of cerebral palsy, as she calls it. It allows me to really depend on Jesus for everything, she says. It also labelled her a hopeless case, an infant who was a ward of the state and for whom the expectations of achievement were extremely low. Doctors predicted Gianna would never even lift her head. She showed them, she began walking at three and has grown into a woman who has run marathons. Now listen to Gianna's brief testimony here. In conclusion, let me say I am alive because of the power of Jesus Christ alone in, in whom I live, move, and have my being. Without him, I would have nothing, and with him, I have all. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce you to one more person. His name is David Ring. In 1953, in Jonesboro, in Arkansas, know where Arkansas is, it's in America, where a president came from. A baby boy was born, dead. The attending physician set his little body aside and tended to his mother for 18 minutes. Now, more than 60 years later, that boy leads an internationally known ministry that encourages hundreds of thousands every year. The Boy Born Dead, name of a book, traces the roots of this harrowing, humorous and heartfelt story. The real life events of David Ring, a boy literally born dead who survives, but not without sobering consequences. Living with the harsh realities of cerebral palsy, Ring faces impossible odds, yet stumbles into an improbable life of inspiration and influence in the small, unassuming town of Liberty in Missouri in the 1960s. As a teenage boy, Ring finds himself tragically orphaned and being shuffled about to various homes. Along this journey, he faces secret, unspeakable atrocities and eventually plunge him into the depths of depression and attempted suicide. But amid the harsh troubles of life, he encounters another boy his age named David, the son of a local pastor. Their unlikely friendship begins on the rocks, but eventually develops into something extraordinary and unique that alters the trajectory of both their lives and, their whole, and the whole town of Liberty forever. There's a common thread that runs through each of these stories. I'm hoping that you have managed to catch maybe even more threads. Each of these people live in salvation. Each of these people are not particularly ideal specimens of humanity, but they all know what it is to experience God's love. There are many more stories that we could reference on this subject, but ultimately, the picture we get of God needs to be one that draws us to him. 
If we have a picture of God that doesn't draw us to him, it may be time to rediscover and challenge ourselves to experience his love. All of the people who have featured this morning will be pleased to look on the face of Jesus, as I trust you will, when he comes back to claim us as his redeemed. To thank Jesus for his grace towards us will be what makes heaven the reason for such an exclamation. <laughs>